30 odd minutes is sponsored in part by Digital Dowsing. Who are you powered by? For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy to ghostly phenomena in our own backyard, we will dive into our psychic abilities and explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Hey! Hey. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. It's great to have you aboard the mothership. We are hovering in front of a very haunted house. Check this out. A little spooky. I don't like the idea of that noose right behind me, but... um, I'm pretty spooked. I know. It is... Are you getting rid of one of us later, or...? No. Better not be me. Never oh, wait a minute. Drek is in here. That's right. <laughs> I'm the youngest. I have the longest to live. Oh, I think man. it should be you guys. That's How are true. you guys, by the way? Uh, doing okay. Doing okay. Staying out of trouble. Well, good. Matt? Hungry. Hungry. Yes. <laughs> Laura? Happy? Happy. Good. These are one-word answers, and that's very helpful on a talk show. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Very hungry? Good. We've missed you. <laughs> or I have missed you. I've missed you guys, too. We've missed you guys. It's been, uh, it's been a few weeks, a little bit of a hiatus, but uh, we've been working. Um, we're going to have a 30 Odd Minutes Live coming up that was live at the Michigan Paracon. That was a great event. We had Lauren Coleman, uh, John Tenney. We had um, a great panel of people. Um, Christopher Lutz, who has been on, on a previous show, he was there. He's on the panel as well. That's going to be uh, really exciting. And so um, always fun to, to get out there and, and bring the, the live show in front of everybody. Uh, but tonight we're talking about The Conjuring. This movie's big. It's made Very a lot big. of money. Oh, yeah. We've seen none of it, though. No. No, I got invited out with friends to go see it, and I refused, because I really do not like scary movies. I'm sorry to say, but I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, Well, Matt, you've seen the movie? Yes, I did. I thought it was very well done theatrically, yes. All right. Scary movie. I mean, I, I mean, I, I've heard from lots of friends who love scary movies that this is, this is a very scary, frightening movie. And guess what, folks? It's based on a real case. And that's what I'm so excited about. It's always the backstory. It always interests me more than the, the, the stuff I've Well, heard. apparently it has an 86% tomato meter freshness, which for movie fans out there, it's the, the greatest rating you can probably get. I mean, that's just fresh. Right. Now I get a kick out right of it because being a Rhode Islander, I mean, it's, it's only about 20 minutes from where I live. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've right. got a lot of Rhode Islanders in our chat room today, and they're super excited. So... Yeah, let's did, get it on. Did you guys know that uh, you can watch every episode live at 30oddminutes.com? You can see our whole archive on iTunes, YouTube, Roku, and so on. Uh, and you can join us in the chat room if you want to interact with, uh, with Laura, get your questions passed up, and things like that. All right, let's get into it. I'm excited. This is going to be big. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the new hit horror movie, The Conjuring, it is based on a real haunt. In 1971, the Perrin family moved into a colonial farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island, with their five daughters. They soon believed they were experiencing something diabolical, and soon paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren got involved. Their story eventually evolved into a two-volume book, House of Darkness, House of Light, which served as the basis for the movie The Conjuring. Here to share her story from the point of view of someone who lived through it, please welcome Andrea Perrin. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Good. Thank you from, for coming aboard the mothership here. And, and uh, I know you're very busy right now. The movie's out, and you are on the media circuit nonstop uh, talking about your family's experiences. That's the thing. When these movies say, based on a true story, you know, sometimes you wonder, well, how based? We're going to find out tonight. So maybe we can start at the very beginning. You're a little girl, born in Rhode Island, and you move into this house in Harrisville. Uh, when, do you, when does your family start to notice something funny is going on? Within about five minutes of moving into the house, the first box that went in in my arms, I walked past a full body apparition that was so dense, he was opaque, he appeared human to me. Okay. And uh, I greeted him. I said, good morning, and he didn't respond, so I kept walking. Uh, My sister Cindy came in right behind me, and said, uh, "Did you know, Mom, who's the other man in the dining room? And my mother said, what other man? And then Nancy came in a minute or so later with her box and said, Cindy, that man in the dining room, he just disappeared. Wow. And, and, I mean, your kids, you're, you're the oldest uh, of five, right? And, and so what, what do you think when yes. you're, hey, this new house is 
haunted. I didn't think anything at that time. I couldn't afford to think anything. We had a huge truck to unload. Right. We were in the midst of a snowstorm. It was absolute chaos. We came in a caravan of cars with relatives that you know had animals, our animals traveling in their cars because there was no room in our car for them. It was nuts. And when you're a child, everything is wide-eyed wonderful. Everything sure. is. Everything that you see is new. We're moving into this new house. It didn't. Uh, it did not connect at first. So it wasn't but scary. Within a night per or se. Two, so it wasn't scary. It was. It was just a man in the house. Mind if I ask a question? Disappeared. <laughs> yes. I got a question. You said you had brought your animals with you. How did they react when they first went mm. into the house? They had to be dragged. All of them. Okay. They had to be dragged, and um, kicking and screaming. Wow. It was uh, it was a bad scene, and it was snowing. It was freezing cold. The dog wouldn't come in the house. The cats wouldn't come in the house. Hmm. They were you know clawing and and uh, because we carried them in our arms, they were so upset and the cat carriers they were thrashing themselves they weren't really even cat carriers i don't know if good ones even existed back then but they were thrashing right. in a box um of some kind and um before long the dog was dead the cats were gone they just moved out wow and, and, huh? and let's take a look we, we have a picture of the house uh, from from back in the 70s it looks like a nondescript farmhouse right i mean pretty simple doesn't look like a foreboding you know, kind of residence, and, and we've got a photo of mom and dad as well, Roger and Carolyn. There they are. Look at that. I mean, what are they telling the kids? I mean, you guys are scared. There's weird stuff going on. What does what mom and dad have to say about it? Oh, Lord. Uh, it's so much, t it's, it's so big. This story is so big. Yeah, I understand. From so many different perspectives. My father did not want to believe that anything untoward was happening in that household. Uh, I know now, having spoken with him at length, that he was just terrified. He could not control the environment. He could not control anything that was happening in there. And the easiest way for him to not deal with it was simply denying its existence. You know, somehow it was a bad dream. It was this. You've heard it all. Sure. I know you have. It's what adults tell children to make them think that the veil exists, and it doesn't. The veil is an illusion. Children are born knowing they're immortal. It's adults that process that information out of them as they mature. And does it put a strain on the family? I mean, is it, you know, is, is it a struggle to live in that house? It resulted in a divorce between my, my parents. Right. And even though it took years for that to happen, the uh, it you know culminated in a divorce, but it began as distrust. It began as you know my father all but uh, in insinuating that we were not being honest with him uh, until he began having incidents and episodes of his own. But by that time, the damage was done, and it was too late. And his five little girls weren't sharing anything with him, and. Uh, he was my mother had had emotionally cut him off. Right. Hmm. Mind if I ask yeah. you a question? How did the sure. relationship between y you and the rest of your siblings go along? I know you're saying it caused strife between your mother and father, but how is the interrelationship between your siblings? That's an excellent question. I don't think I've ever heard that before. It really is. We packed like wolves. Okay. I mean, we became a pack. For. We traveled in numbers. We used the bathroom in multiples of three or more hmm. because there was an evil male presence in that house that frequently um, lurked. There, you couldn't use the bathroom without feeling like you were being watched. It was extremely uncomfortable. That's the reason why I asked the question. I've worked with a number of different uh, cases that have had large numbers of children, and one of the hallmarks that I look for is the children cloistering together for for comfort and safety that's that's a natural reaction for children that you know if the parents aren't around they look for safety in themselves with each other sure so that's why i asked a chapter the in the book called safety in numbers that's one of the chapters of the book 
Okay. Right. Of the first volume, anyway. One of the things I find interesting is that I, I, I heard a few of the other interviews that you've given, and I was wondering, a lot of times you mentioned that you did not want to leave the house, that it was a very, uh, almost like a tragic thing for you to leave the house after the 10 years that you spent there, and just based on, well, from what I hear about your experiences, it sounds really terrifying. Why were you so sad to leave? From the moment I, and I'll only speak for myself right now, but from the moment that I saw the farm for the first time, I didn't want to leave it from that day. It felt like home to me. And in fact, it's the only place I've ever lived that did feel like home to me. And I can't explain that. It's, it's just, it's a visceral sensation. I've lived in a lot of places. I've had beautiful homes, but that cold, frigid, stark, old farmhouse was home to me. And it really was to everyone in our family. There was a sense of familiarity and a, and a familial sense that we belonged there. And every single one of us felt it. But it wasn't until I was 17 that I discovered why I felt it personally. So what's interesting is I, um, I once interviewed George Lutz. George Lutz, of course, was the, the, the man behind the Amityville story. It was his family's uh, story, 28 days in that house in Amityville. And I, said, I asked the same question. I said, well, this place is scary. And you know there was these murders that happened there. Do you, do you just stay out of the house, stay out all night, whatever, just to not come home? And he said the house was charming. You know, mm. that as, as frightening as his family would get, he didn't want to leave. Yeah. And um, so I've heard it before. You know, yeah. I've heard this before from, the lore. from George Lutz. Yeah. Yeah. It's the lore. Yeah, That's, right. That so, and I've heard you referring to this house as uh, heaven on earth. So it's just such yeah. a strange uh, just juxtaposition with your actual experiences. Interesting. Right. So let's talk about, you've got something going on. How do paranormal investigators start to get involved? I know Ed and Lorraine were not the first to, to uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren were not the first to come to the house. But uh, how, how does it start to, to be where you start bringing people in? Well, what happened was, and there's some dispute um, between my dear friend Keith Johnson and myself. You know, we've agreed to disagree. Okay. Uh, I, I love him dearly. He's a wonderful, oh, a golden soul. He, um, he and his group, Pyro, uh -huh. along with his brother Keith, Donna, and uh, several people, um, came to the house. Now, he said that my mother called him called an, an ad that he had placed and that he spoke with her at length, but my mother has no recollection of it at all and, in fact, said she never asked anybody for help. She thinks that one of her friends posed as her and called because she was so worried about us. Um, she had a couple of friends close enough that knew what was happening. But anyway, they showed up in August of 1973 and Keith had a really amazing experience. And I know he's written at length about it, so I don't want to tip his hand. And I know you'll probably have him on as a guest, so it'll give him sure. you know, something to talk about. Uh, but he had an amazing experience in that house. And it changed his life and his perspective on everything. Right. Um, and they left rather quickly after an extended visit that afternoon. But he is the one that went um, to Ed and Lorraine Warren. And that's one of the things that needs to be clarified, if I could just take two minutes uh, sure. around the film. Um, there are several things in the film that I have uh, diligently clarified as I've gone around the country. Because I understand that in broad sweeping strokes, it tells our our family story beautifully, uh, you know, love conquering fear, good conquering evil, you know, th those are the broad strokes of the story. But the fact is that the fine lines of history are written in these books in great detail. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, was a discrepancy in the film was that we were not godless heathens. I understand why they <laughs> wanted to make that delineation, you know, that uh, right. I understand that because, you know, people see things in black and white. But the fact is that my father was an altar boy. He was raised in serious Roman Catholic tradition, went to Catholic school, was born in a Catholic hospital, um, as so was I. And um, all of us were born and raised Catholic. All of us were baptized. We did not abandon the Catholic Church. It abandoned us. Another thing, my mother would never 
ever have done anything to hurt any of her children. Let me say that first and foremost. Sure. And another thing that I really want to bring up about the film is that um, try as they might, it reflects um, kind of a presupposition that Ed and Lorraine Warren came in and solved everything, that they virtually moved in with us and solved everything. And really, that's not what happened at all. In fact, there's a chapter in volume two called Warren Peace, spelled W-A-R-R-E-N right. Peace. And, they, and I truly believe that they tried to bring us some peace, some closure, to move the spirits on along, as it were. I mean, they were so concerned about the welfare of the spirits that my mother was rather resentful about that because she thought that they should be a little more concerned with the mortals rather than the immortal souls. Um, but Mrs. Warren explained very kindly that no one's free until everyone is free. And her intention was to clear that house, but they couldn't do it. And what they did was prompt a seance that my, my mother was almost catatonic by the time Ed and my father were done arguing about whether or not it should even occur. And she was just slipping away from us. And it was very frightening. And I understand why they pressed the way they did. But the fact of the matter is they opened a door that they could not close. And something, there was no exorcism in that house, but there was a seance that went very badly wrong. And they were not able to control what happened that night. And right. they were summarily dismissed from the house in language that I could not use even on Skype. <laughs> right. So um, my father was extremely angry. I think the word we're seeking is livid. Right. And um, it was an, it's all detailed in the books. But the movie, I think the movie's beautiful. I think that it's informational. I think that it does a, a lovely job explaining what Ed and Lorraine Warren did for 50 years. But they always said of more than 10,000 cases that they investigated and they went all over the world. They always said ours was, in their own words, the most compelling, the most intense, the most disturbing, and the most significant investigation they ever conducted. Amazing. All right, Andrew, we have to take a quick break for the news. We're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit more about that investigation and, of course, life since moving out of the house and now since the movie. So we'll be back right after the news. A health food store in Whitstable, England, has released a surveillance video that they say may be evidence of ghostly activity in their shop. The video was recorded during normal business hours and shows an unidentified customer shopping in one of the store's aisles when a box of tea bags leaves the shelf behind him and hovers in midair. While the box remains floating behind the man, another box falls to the floor from a shelf he is facing. As the customer bends to pick up the box, the first box then drops to the floor. The man's reaction seems to indicate that he was unaware of what had just happened as he replaces both boxes back on their shelves. The owner of the Whitstable Nutrition Center, Michelle Newbold, said that she has never seen anything like this since she has been running the shop. Newbold said that the customer didn't tell anyone in the store about the tea boxes leaving the shelves, and she doesn't even know who he is. She said that this odd activity was only discovered by chance during a weekly review of the shop's security recordings. Ms. Dubol says she is a skeptic of the paranormal and has no explanation for how this could have happened. However, most people who have seen this video feel that the shop staged the whole thing in an attempt to get some cheap publicity. If so, this would not be the first time that paranormal research has been teabagged by hoaxers. I'm Andrew Lake, and oddly enough, that's the news. <laughs> nice story, Andrew. Thank you so much. You know, the funny thing about that video clip, and, and we watched it and debated it, you know, yeah. you see a guy in the back sidestep behind the aisle before it happens. Um, and what a great publicity stunt, if that's indeed what it is. But also, weird, weird yeah, stuff It's a little up. hard to explain how they did it if it is, yeah. Yeah, if it yeah. is tricks. Yeah. It is indeed. Sure. So, all right. Good stuff. Okay, so um, I, I grew up in the town next to Ed and Lorraine Warren. I've known them since I was 10 years old. And uh, I remember them talking about this case uh, as a kid, and, and they talked about cool. it many times since. So, and also in their basement, um, there's a, there's a, we have a photo of this doll, Annabelle. And um, as you can see, this is a photo that was taken when I was interviewing them for a newspaper article back in the 90s. Positively, do not open, do not touch. And it's one of the most compelling stories they tell, one of the most frightening uh, stories they tell. 
And of course, there's a connection to this case. Uh, Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about, about this uh, Annabelle doll? Well, I do know that it is the case that put the Warrens on the map. And that's a funny thing to say because truly, who was doing it before them? Right. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, they Holter are and, yeah. like the parents, the godparents. I don't know. They started a movement. They began a worldwide movement by doing scientific investigation of the supernatural. And to my knowledge, even though there have been uh, seances going on for millennia, that you know, people have been dabbling in the dark arts for years and years, these, to my knowledge, were the first people who ever began serious investigation of incidents and in, in specific places, homes, you know, well, where they literally uh, wired. Well, let's not forget the Club of England. Created. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's, there's they, been yeah. a few, but there's Harry no doubt. Price, yeah, Harry yeah. Price and Hans Holzer Holzer. and so on and uh, Brad Steiger, yes. but of yeah. course. Uh, but no, but uh, especially in this region, I think Ed and Lorraine were, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, oh, yes. stand yeah. above. The, and and we, have to, we have to remind our audience of something. 1970s mm-hmm. is not like today, where yeah. there's a million ghost shows on TV no, and everybody's in a ghost group and it's no big deal to call in a ghost hunter. It was a very big deal. You know, it was completely Plus. stigmatized. You worried about being put away and locked up for this kind of thing. It's a completely different context than today mm-hmm. uh, when you're talking about this stuff. It's so easy to forget because mm. the, the, the yeah. subject's so popular. So, so um, you know, we talked about the Warrens. Tell us about this doll, this, this Annabelle doll, because it really is frightening. What, what was the connection? Well, there really wasn't a connection. The connection that is drawn in the film, Mm -hmm. the Annabelle doll had nothing to do whatsoever with our case. Right. However, uh, the reason that it is used and that story is told the way that it is in the film is because it was the last major case prior to discovering us. And when Keith Johnson told the Warrens about us, they, um, you know, the pyro group brought them in And then they were rather shunted aside as though they were just kids who knew nothing. Uh, And the Warrens considered themselves the authority figures, the experts. And, you know, perhaps they had a few more years on them, but no one can say Keith didn't have his own experiences coming in. As an 18, 19 year old, he knew what he was talking about as well. And uh, but he brought them in because he figured this was pretty serious after what happened to him at the farm. And um, and he did come back to the farm with them once during their investigation. But then they came alone after that, unless they came the night of the seance. They came with a priest, a medium and an entire technical crew. Right. Let's fast forward now. You move out of the house and obviously the story affected you so much. You've written uh, you know, two volumes of, of, uh, of a book on it with a third, I understand, in the works, um, you know, about just how complex the, those 10 years of your life were for yourself and for your family. Uh, at what point does, does, uh, does the movie company get involved? At what point does this start to go Hollywood? Interestingly, I was about six weeks into writing the manuscript when uh, I got my first call from a Hollywood producer. And I had not even told my parents yet uh, there was a um, <laughs> a convergence of events which had occurred, a convergence of events that involved the uh, the dogs uh, uh, making me crazy. The dogs <laughs> making me crazy. We have a cameo uh, in the back. Wait. That's funny. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, don't no, be. That's great. Like it happens. That. It's not uh, the first time. That's, seriously. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Warren had been approached about having the story told on film at the same time that I began writing the books, right. literally the same time. And then uh, the producer found a way to get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> we Welcome speak to my world. You think it was weird living at the farm? Come to this town. It's <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll go with the dog before the ghost. That's Any right. Day. <laughs> So, so, so people are getting involved and, and interested because it, it is a compelling story, especially when, when you've got a family affected where they live. One of the things that's so powerful about these types of stories to me is that your home, I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? This is psychology 101. You need to feel safe and secure. If mm-hmm. you don't feel, you need food and shelter, but you need personal safety, right? That's the next yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you can't live. You no. can't be oh, yeah. happy. You can't rest. You can't do anything. And your home is your castle. 
And to have an intruder there, someone that you can't oh. see or get rid of or whatever, um, is, is one of the most unnerving things that someone can go through. And imagine yeah, that going on for a decade. We were the intruders. We okay. were the intruders. It was their home before it was ours. And our, pre, our predisposition to them was to uh, respect that it was their home first. So we had a, a, an odd, good word choice for this show, uh, an odd understanding with them after some period of time where we simply got used to each other. Right. And that seemed to be what mitigated the activity. Because when Ed and Lorraine Warren came to the house, it got very busy. It had been quiet for a while before they came. And Mrs. Warren even said, this could stir things up. But I'll tell you something on her behalf. I will tell you this, Jeff. That woman walked into our house with her husband, knowing absolutely nothing of the history of the house, nothing. And she walked over to our old black stove, put her hand on the stove, covered her head like this and closed her eyes. And she said, I sense a malignant presence. Her name is Bathsheba. Now let's There's talk about no that. There's no conceivable way she knew that. Now Bathsheba, which I know is, is a prominent figure um, you know, in your life, we've got a photo of her grave. Can you give us very quickly, because we are running up near the end, what is the backstory here? What's, what, what do you think caused the haunting? I think that Bathsheba's gotten a really bad rap, and she's taken the fall for another spirit in the house, a female entity who my father believes is Mrs. John Arnold, because when she attacked my mother uh, the night of the torches incident, she said to my mom, "'Twas mistress once afore ye came, and mistress here will be anon. We'll, fire, we'll drive ye out with fiery broom, we'll drive ye mad with death and gloom." That's language that had become archaic usage by the late 1800s when Bathsheba was alive. Mrs. Arnold lived in the 1700s. She hung herself in the barn at the age of 93. Susan Arnold hung herself in the morning room outside of my uh, bedroom. Uh, there were so many deaths by suicide in that house. There were tragic deaths. There right. were at least a dozen spirits in that house that we encountered over the course of 10 years. Is Bathsheba still with you? We have a question here from uh, one of our uh, chat room uh, viewers. Who asked that? Ah, let's see. Uh, Julie. Julie's asking. I, oh, Julie. Uh, I would have to say yes. I had it out with her. She was very upset. Uh, people are going to think I'm a flake, but the fact of the matter is she was very upset uh, about the film and acted out. Mm -hmm. Uh, she really did. Around the day we were on the set, uh, we had a very bad incident. My mother fell. She claimed she was pushed while she was alone in this house, and the rest of us were on the set. When we got to the hospital, they finally got through to us. We'd had a major incident on the set at the same time, a rogue wind that came through and just blew our interview session apart. And it happened to be that it lined up exactly with the time that my mother fell in this house and broke her hip. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I had it out with her at that point. She's been pretty subdued ever since. So, but, uh, you know, I unleashed a lot of mediums and psychics. I mean, I told everybody, that's it. And I told her, don't ever touch my mother again. Don't ever hurt my mother again. If you have an issue, you have it with me. I'm the one that signed the movie contract. And the thing she's upset about is that a man plays her in the movie. Oh, and, she, and she's very vain, and she thinks that that's an offense Andrea, to her. Andrea, it's an amazing story. Stuff following you that's not uh, uncommon. Real quick, right up at the end of the show, we want to thank you for joining us. We do want to say the folks who live in the house now are having a real problem yeah, with yes. trespassers night and day. Stay away from the house, folks. It's not their story. It's Andrea's story. Email her. Go to her website. Check out her books. We're going to have links to hers from ours. Uh, that's where you're going to find the real story. You've got to leave the folks there alone. We really appreciate you joining Please. us, Andrea. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Scary journey. Amazing Andrea and story. I will be standing guard. <laughs> They'll be there. All right, until next time, folks. Stay on.
Thank you.